welcome back to the McCann Dogs podcast. This is episode 34 in our podcast series and joining me this week, as she does every week, is the Director of Online Training at the My Dog Can Program, uh, Instructor Shannon Viljasso. Thanks for joining us, Shannon. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Now, this week we wanted to talk about steps before you get your puppy and how you might acquire your puppy. And we think there are some really important things that you need to be aware of. You know, getting a puppy is such an exciting time, but there are some really important factors that you need to take into consideration before you actually get that puppy. My name's Ken Steep, and welcome back to McCann Dogs. So, Shannon, on your blog post on the McCandogs.com website, uh, you published a blog that I found really, really interesting. And I think it's really important for anyone who's considering getting a puppy. And it's titled Red Flags When Buying a Puppy. Now, where did the, um, the motivation for this come from? I was actually um, following a story on Facebook that some of uh, some of our audience listeners may have seen as well. And it was just this very sad story about a family that went out to purchase a Border Collie puppy and they were excited and, you know, all the anticipations that, that come along with something great that's about to happen in your life. And, you know, several months of planning and waiting and hoping and, you know, they settled on this puppy. They settled on a breeder who seemed to be very nice. They chatted with her on the phone. Life was wonderful. They paid for the puppy. And then the day came where they were, were to go and pick up the puppy and the breeder said, you know, change of plans. Something's happened at my house. I can't have you come to my house, but I'm going to meet you in a strip mall or something of that nature. So she did. And she handed over a puppy that was literally hours from being dead, which is oh. very, very sad. The puppy actually had parvo and the people right away recognized ran the dog to the emergency vet and unfortunately they weren't able to save it so here you've got this family and these children who are just devastated and you know in addition to being heartbroken that that all of this anticipation has come to no real fruition or or this awful situation not only that but they're also out quite a bit of money because they had already paid the breeder for the puppy and of course the breeder was not coming back and saying, I'm so sorry, your puppy died. The breeder was having nothing to do with them at that point. And you know, unfortunately, that's a very irresponsible type of breeding situation. And I thought after seeing that story, and it, it really broke my heart, I thought sure. I can't even imagine going through that. And I was reading some of the comments on, it was on Facebook, I was reading some of the comments and there was a lot of people that were angry with this couple for going out and, and purchasing this puppy and, and putting blind faith into this situation and into this process. And the people kept saying, you know what, we've learned our lesson. We learned our lesson the hard way, unfortunately, but we've learned our lesson. We had no idea that this could even potentially be an issue. And I thought, you know what, that's a really valid thing. There's probably a lot of people that haven't necessarily been really engrossed in the dog world and don't know how things work and what to look for in a reputable breeder rather than, you know, somebody very irresponsible like this person was. And you know, finding somebody that you can not only trust to deliver a healthy, happy puppy to you after that, you know, eight weeks that you've waited, but also someone that you potentially can work with for the rest of the dog's life. Because if you run into trouble somewhere along the line with that puppy, one of the first resources that I always take into consideration with my own dogs is going back and talking to the breeder. And, and you want somebody who's going to be there for the rest of the dog's life and who's going to be supportive of you in your journey with that puppy. Somebody who's just in it to make five or $800 and then send you on your way really isn't the best prospect because you want somebody who knows the breed, knows the dogs, can help you out with the little ins and outs of day-to-day -day life and can also support you through things that might happen throughout the dog's lifetime. So finding a good breeder that's really invested in their dogs, it's not a hard process at all, but it's such an important process. So we thought we'd talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, and just to speak to the uh, idea that these people didn't know, I mean, uh, every single week we help over 500 dogs uh, to become well-behaved four-legged family members. And we have lots and lots of students that are first-time dog owners, and they just don't know. They haven't had that experience. So I can completely see how someone might get themselves into this situation because they just didn't know what questions to ask. So today we're going to answer some of those questions. And Shannon has created um, a a list of, uh, is there four, there's four or five things that I think are real red flags when it comes to uh, buying a puppy. And and let's talk about the first one, Shannon, and it's that make sure the puppies exist. And I mean, this sounds, uh, you know, like it would be common sense, but uh, the internet is, it can be a dangerous place and uh, people can be misled quite easily. Definitely, definitely. It's really easy to find resources to put on a good show out there. So if you've got prospects uh, on a breeder and you're watching puppies on, you know, pop up on websites and you settle on one where you just see pictures, I wouldn't believe that the puppy exists based solely on those pictures. It's so easy to find pictures on the internet. It's so easy to save pictures now from, you know, maybe maybe 10 years ago, somebody did breed a litter and they're, they've are they been running a scam for all these years trying to convince people that they're breeding more puppies and send me $500 and at the end of the eight weeks, I'll send you your puppy. And there's not even a puppy to begin with, but the money's already changed hands and the, the breeder um, has already disappeared and you're left with no puppy, no money. You're left in a situation where, you know, essentially you've been scammed. Unfortunately, it's just, it's something that happens in every facet of society and trying to find a dog is no different. There's lots of people who are willing to prey on people who are excited about and looking for a puppy and not necessarily understanding how to make sure that they are safe in that process. So don't take just the word of pictures. Um, a lot of the times breeders won't want you to come out for the first few weeks of the puppy's lives, lives, which is certainly understandable. You know, they're, they're very susceptible to illness and bacteria at that point. The, the mother, if, especially if they're a first time mother could very well be nervous of people coming near her puppies when they're still that young. Um, but after a few weeks, once the puppies have, you know, started to open their eyes and ears and move around and interact and whatnot, it's always important that the puppy is now in a busy area of the home for a lot of the day. So they're getting used to people around and things around. And it's very important that that's an opportunity for you to go and meet with the breeder and see the pups, meet the parents. You know, ideally you could meet both parents, but a lot of the times the the sire is not on site. So you should at least be able to meet the dam unless there's some sort of an extenuating circumstance there. But you want to meet that um, you want to meet that mother. You want to make sure that she's as, as sweet as you're hoping for, because that's going to be a direct mirror of what your puppy's going to be like as an adult. So you know, sometimes moms can be a little bit protective when they've got newborn puppies, but outside of that situation, the, the dog should be friendly and sweet and, and should be a reflection of what you're looking for in a puppy. It also gives you an opportunity to see how the puppies are being raised, to see if there is in fact a puppy for you in that litter, to make be start narrowing down choices or to let the breeder know what you're looking for as far as the sex of the puppy, as far as the temperament of the puppy. You know, do you want a really, really busy puppy or do you want something that's a little bit more laid back? All of those things are, you know, in the first meeting with the breeder, those are great things to discuss and start to sort of narrow down what it is you're looking for. You don't want to just assume the puppy's there and wait until the puppy falls into your hands, you want to know that it's going to be a good fit for your family. So having as many conversations with the person that's going to know that puppy best at that point, which is the breeder, having as many conversations as possible with them is really going to set you on the right track with things. So first off, it again, it confirms those puppies actually exist. They're there and there's enough puppies in that litter that you will potentially get to take one of those home and you'll get an opportunity to know whether or not that's going to be a, a good fit for you. And I I also think about some situations where people maybe can't get to the breeder. Maybe they're talking to a, uh, you know, a breeder that's too far away or, you know, there's some sort of issue that they can't go and physically visit the puppies. And I noticed on your list of uh, some of the red flags is ask for references. And I think that's a really, really important one to keep in mind. 
Definitely. So a lot of the times, if you're looking at a puppy from far away, you might already be involved in that breed community and you might know that breeder. And of course, that's going to be the best endorsement possible is if you know that breeder, you know what they're producing, you know what they're doing with their dogs, you know that they're on the up and up as far as health issues and things like that. That's wonderful. However, if you don't know the breeder, then you're, you're putting a lot of faith in the process, which a lot of the times turns out great, but sometimes not so much. So um, breeders should always be able to provide you with a reference or two. And, you know, barring that, you should be able to say, hey, well, maybe I can talk to your veterinarian and, and they can call their vet and give their vet permission to talk to you so that you can at least call and say, you know, I'm looking at um, such and such and such and such a kennel. And I just want to make sure that there's nothing really dubious going on. I, I want to make sure you know this person. They're good at bringing their dogs in for health checks and the puppies are usually healthy. And, you you, know, you can get some good opinions from people within the community as well. Um, I like to um, I like to help people with toller education through the Ontario Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever Club and the National Club as well. Um, I've served on both boards a number of times over the years, and I will get calls quite a bit from people who are interested in tollers and want to know a little bit more about the breed. So there's all sorts of people like me that are involved in breed breed clubs and happy to help you. So don't hesitate to reach out to those people, you know, go and find the, um, you know, if you're looking at labs, go to the Labrador Club of Canada website, or the, if there's a uh, regional club or something of that nature, and reach out to people, say, you know, I'm looking for a good lab, I want to make sure that I get a healthy dog, I want to make sure that I'm working with a good breeder, can you give me any advice? And it, certainly there's going to be someone within that breed club that is absolutely happy to do outreach work and to chat with you and to tell you, both the negatives and the positives of the breed that you're about to get into. Because I'll tell you for a fact, if you can live with the negatives of a breed and every single breed has them, you will love the positives, but you have to be able to get, get over the negatives. For example, if you don't like shedding dogs, there's a whole bunch of dogs that you are going to right away say, no, that is way too big of a negativity factor for me because the golden retriever and uh, the Labrador retriever, they're going to spew fur all over my house. It's so true. chatting with, Absolutely, 100%. Chatting with the um, the breed club people, those are the people that know the breeds. They know, you know what, you're never going to go a day without vacuuming your house if you want your floors to be spotless. So you know, think twice if you want a lab then. You might want a poodle instead that's not necessarily shedding, so you've not got not got fur all over your house. All those things, they're, they're, it's great information. It's a great jumping off point for information. And you will also be able to say, okay, and I'm looking at such and such a breeder. What can you tell me about them? Are they a member of your club? Do they follow the code of ethics of your club? You know, Are they a, a member of good standing in your club? All of those things are going to be good, good bits of information. If they're not a member in good standing, especially if they're not in good standing with the club, that's a red flag. You know, there, there might be legitimate reasons why, but you need to delve deep into that. Are they not an upstanding member of the club because they've had a falling out with a person on the club board or because they're breeding dogs that have known health issues and the club, of course, is going to frown upon that and not allow them to be part of the club anymore. So all those things are really important details to know. Yeah, I think that's really, really good insight. Um, you also mentioned about not just handing over a deposit, which sounds like it was the case in uh, the uh, story that you mentioned at the top of the podcast, but uh, it's really important that you don't just hand over uh, a deposit for the puppy and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every breeder is going to be different as far as their deposit policies. So that's why you need to make sure that you talk to them and map out all the details ahead of time. There's, It's not a problem to give a deposit to a breeder. Certainly they are working hard to raise these puppies and the good breeders are working hard to raise the puppies right, give them the absolute best start in life, make sure they have the best nutrition, make sure they get all their health checks in. And all of that costs money. The health testing for the parents, it all costs a lot of money, which is is why they will often ask for a deposit to offset some of those costs. However, you need to protect your interests in that. And there are some breeders that will take a deposit, but absolutely refund it no matter what. Anytime that person no longer wants one of those puppies, I would think the breeder would be happy to say, 
you know what? I'm glad you said it now rather than in four weeks when the puppy was in your home and then the puppy gets shipped around somewhere or maybe ends up in the SPCA because they really weren't wanted. It was sort of a, a fly by night excitement moment and now they're regretting it, but they've given you a deposit so they don't want to lose their money. So they keep the puppy and then potentially sell it and the breeder's going to lose track of that puppy. You know, that sort of creates a real no win situation for everyone. So some breeders will work on that model. I personally, I myself would make sure that if I was breeding dogs and someone said, you know what, I think I changed my mind. I don't want this puppy. I'd like my deposit back. Here you go. If you don't want the puppy, that is absolutely okay. And I'm so glad I know about it now rather than potentially losing that puppy to the system somewhere along the road. So I'd rather keep that puppy and raise it myself than have it in a situation where it's not wanted and ends up in a bad situation. So um, it, it's very legitimate for breeders to take deposits. But one, is it going to be refundable or is it going to be specifically a non-refundable deposit? And if it's a non-refundable deposit, and sometimes we're talking about a thousand dollars, you know, you might be talking about five dollars It's very rare that it's just a really small deposit of $100 or so. It's usually going to be a significant amount of the price of the puppy. So it's a it's a chunk of money to have to part with. If it's a non-refundable deposit, find out as many details as you can. You know, things like, are they going to be... Um, are the puppies even on the ground yet? That's the first thing I would ask. Do Does that breeder know for sure that there is a puppy out of those six puppies that are on the ground that is earmarked for you? So first off, there's a viable puppy that exists at that point that you're putting a deposit on. You might not have chosen the specific puppy yet, but you do want to make sure that there is one that is probably going to you. Um, second off, you want to make sure that uh, the puppy is going to be suitable for your family. So if you get to the end of the eight weeks and all of those six puppies have turned into puppies that are bouncing off the wall and really suitable for sh for um, busy working homes, but not so much for a family pet home that wants, you know, a dog that's going to be happy to take a couple of uh, walks a day and then hang out on the couch while you're at work, that's probably not the same puppy. So if all six of those puppies are now dogs that you don't think will fit well into your lifestyle, what happens to your deposit? You know, at that point, can you have your deposit back or is it going to be carried over to another litter so you can potentially try again? How much time are you going to have to do that? You know, is there going to be a, a point of limitations where the breeder says, okay, you only get to choose a puppy out of this litter. That's it. That's all. If you don't like one from this litter, too bad, so sad, you lose your deposit. Or is it going to be a situation where the breeder wants you to have the best possible fit for your, your lifestyle? They don't have a puppy for you in this litter, but if you're both willing to carry it over to the next litter, that's a good thing to know or to agree upon ahead of time how many times are you going to be able to do that what is there a, a, a point of limitation on the time that they're willing to carry over that deposit all those things you should get in writing in the contract before you hand over any money and not just so that you know that you've got something fail safe if you do happen to end up taking the the person to small claims court or something like that but to make sure that you're being fair for both of the people in that situation so for example, a breeder's perspective on this is going to be completely different because of the costs and the time involved and things like that. Whereas the puppy buyer's perspective is all about the anticipation of waiting, waiting, waiting. They're not seeing the work and the effort that's going into the puppy. So there's there's very different perspectives on what that money is actually earmarked to do and whether or not it's fair for both parties to have it returned or not have it returned. So just sitting down and talking to the breeder and working out those details ahead of time, making sure it's in writing, there's no misunderstandings. And that way, there's not going to be any hurt feelings. There's not going to be any hardships at the end of it. You know, if things do go wrong, which of course, sometimes they do, that's just life. You've got something in place that says what the next step is and how you're, you're going to be protected in that situation and how the breeder is going to be protected as well. Yeah, I, I really think that's important. And when you mentioned the breeders that have questions for you, I, I love that idea. I like when a breeder's that invested in making sure that they find the right home, uh, you know, for their the puppies in their litters. When you talked about asking questions of the breeder, those aren't the only questions uh, that you talk about in your blog post. You talk a little bit about asking questions about the puppy's health history. Yes, absolutely. And this is where your research is really going to pay off because again, sadly, there's always somebody out there who is willing to lie and 
con just to get your money. So they'll tell you anything. So knowing the breed that you're that you're interested in, for example, if you're looking at golden retrievers, well, golden retrievers have hip and heart issues. So those are things that the parents should definitely be tested for. Um, they should be uh, cleared for some other things as well. Um, but you'll have to research and find out. And this is where breed clubs come in so, so handy because they know the testing. They know the current genetic issues that are going on in the breed. They're the, usually the ones that are putting up the money to do the research to help you know, better the health of those breeds. So they're going to be the best sources of information for that particular breed to tell you, well, you need to look for eye tests and you need to make sure that the that the hips are, are done and you need to make sure there's no patella issues. And, you know, any of the problems that come along with that specific breed, the parents should be tested for. So that's um, that's something that you're going to find out, you're going to research. And then you when you approach the breeder and say, okay, so these are the things that I read about the golden retriever and the health issues that come along with the golden retriever. So um, please tell me about your breeding program and what you've done in yours. And, and the breeder should have organized information of the tests that they've done, the results from eye tests and, and hips and hearts, and they should be able to provide you with the certifications for the problems within their breed. And they should be able to prove to you that genetically those problems should not be passed on from those parents because you've tested to make sure they don't have those problems. So once you get down the road, you're not in a situation where now you've got your wonderful golden retriever puppy and you're in love and the dog just turned eight months old and you put in all this time and effort and training and now all of a sudden the dog starts coughing and you take them to the vet and there's a, a, a heart problem there. You know, the, the cost that you're going to save, the money that you're going to save by going to the backyard breeder, which is somebody who's not doing those health tests, who just basically has had a litter of puppies and they think it's wonderful and they have these cute, adorable puppies to sell and they sell them for $250 instead of $1,200. That money that you're going to save from the initial purchase price of the puppy, you will use down the road with a health issue potentially if you don't look for those health clearances. So make sure that you know at least the things that are major issues in the breed, that the breeder you're working with is breeding away from those, is trying their best to make sure that they're, they're going to provide you with a healthy puppy that for the rest of the dog's life hopefully will be as healthy as possible and you're not going to run into those issues. Yeah, and I think you really highlight that uh, you know doing your due diligence is so important when it comes to uh, getting Getting that new puppy for your household, um, you know, you talked a little bit uh, about price shopping, and uh, you know, getting a puppy is potentially a 15-year investment. And uh, you know, uh, t t talk a little bit more about the idea that some people might feel that uh, you know, saving $500 on a puppy is uh, a better deal. Yeah. So, I mean, there's reasons why this puppy over here costs $250 and this puppy over here costs $1,200. And that is the care and the time invested in them. That is the health testing. Absolutely. You know, if they have, if the breeder has spent time proving that dog in venues over its life. So for example, golden retrievers are meant to retrieve game birds. So does that dog have a history in hunting? Does that dog have a history where they are um, they have been tested there's there's all sorts of hunt tests that you can that you can participate in these days so even if you're not a hunter you can still prove that this dog is willing to swim they're willing to pick up game they're willing to work with me in the field all day you know as opposed to the dog that's just better suited as a family pet and maybe a couch potato or a few walks through the day you don't necessarily care as much if that dog can do what they were bred to do however you might care about the things like confirmation of the dog, making sure that structurally they're sound enough that even being a couch potato, by the time they hit eight, you don't want that dog to be limited as far as their physical capabilities because their structure was so poor that the pounding they've taken for the last eight years, just living normal life, now means they've got a ton of arthritis or hip dysplasia, or you know, you end up in a situation where now at eight, you have to make really hard calls about what you're going to do with your dog's future because their quality of life is now suffering because physically they were not put together well enough. So that's another really big difference with a dog that costs $250 versus $1,200. And 
don't um, don't think that just because the dog is expensive, it's going to be a great dog either. This is where it's so important to do your research because there's just as many people that are willing to say, okay, well, this puppy's $3,000 because it's great, but what proof do you have of that? There, there's just as many people who are willing to up the price rather than sell a whole bunch at 250. They're willing to sell a few at 3000 and you think you're getting a great dog because it was super expensive. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Again, just make sure you're seeing health tests. Make sure that the dog is, the, the dogs that um, have made the puppies are physically capable of moving and being regular dogs. They're not stuck in a situation where they've got hip dysplasia and there's been no testing for hip dysplasia in the, in the breed or in that um, particular breeding pair. And now the puppies are, are growing up and, and they're testing for hip dysplasia as well. So that, that's part of what you're paying for is making sure those health tests are done and making sure that you've got somebody who can support you through the rest of the dog's life, making sure that dog has had a good start. You know, there's a big difference in nutrition between somebody who is feeding the bargain brand of dog food to raise those puppies for the first eight weeks versus somebody who's put in a lot of time and effort and thought into what they're feeding those puppies and the nutrition that those dogs are getting as they are being weaned off of their mother. So things like that, it, it's very expensive to raise puppies. A lot of people think that um, you make thousands and thousands of dollars raising puppies. That is not true. It costs a lot of money to raise prop puppies properly. And that's when things go well. You know, sometimes there's situations where a breeder has a litter of two puppies and they need to do an emergency C-section, which is going to cost quite a bit of money. And, you know, there's all these expenses that add up. So over time, they need to make sure that they're not losing money on their venture because then they're not going to want to breed dogs anymore. You know, nobody's breeding dogs to get rich in most cases, unless they're unscrupulous. If you're doing it right, you're not going to be making a ton of money, but you do need to cover your costs. You can't be in a situation where now you can't feed your family because you put so much money into these puppies and not getting it back. So, you know, no, very important to know what you're paying for when you pay those purebred dog prices and very important to still do your research and make sure that even though it's the high price tag you're still getting the quality in that dog yeah i i know this firsthand um having uh marty and deb the founders of the Mc, of mccann professional dog trainers uh couple of years ago, almost two years ago now, I had a litter of border collie puppies and I know the time investment. I know the monetary investment that's required to make sure that, uh, you know, everything's done right and that you give uh, those puppies the best opportunity to find the right homes. And you want to make sure that those puppies are, uh, you know, the best that they can be. Definitely. Now, it can be not for the faint of heart a lot of times. For Breaking sure. Dogs. Now we've talked a lot about puppies and, uh, we have lots of students that come through the uh, our grade one program who have uh, got a, a dog from a rescue or a dog from a shelter. And uh, most of the time, you know, it's uh, without issue, but I've heard a couple of horror stories of students that come through. Now, what sort of uh, things do people need to keep in mind if they're looking for a, a rescue dog? Yeah, well, and, and sadly, again, this is a situation where a lot of people are willing to take advantage. And there's there's this scene set where it pulls at your heartstrings. So it is very easy for someone to say, oh, I know how to get a whole bunch of puppies, spay and neuter them really cheap, call them rescues, and then sell them. So if you are looking into a rescue, that is wonderful. But do your homework there too. Don't assume just because somebody is saying that the dog is in a rescue situation that that is actually a legitimate proposition. And again, a lot of the same problems can crop up. You can end up in a situation where you've paid someone money and you show up to pick up a dog and there is no dog because again, there are people who are willing to take advantage in this situation. Um, after events like Katrina, it became very widespread that there was money to be made in selling dogs as rescue dogs. So I would check to make sure that there's a charitable registration number. I would check for references on the rescue. You know, again, you just want to make sure that you're not ending up in a situation where now you are stuck. If that dog doesn't end up being a good fit in your lifestyle, it, we have again, very sadly, very unfortunately, we have people call us and say, you know, I have this, I have this rescue dog. He just bit me. And I can't get a hold of the rescue. They won't take the rest. They won't take this dog back. You know, I don't know what to do. And now I don't know how to handle this dog. 
and I'm at a loss as far as what I'm going to do. And they're also out, you know, usually four or five hundred dollars for the whole ordeal as well. And they've got a dog that they don't know how to manage and don't know how to handle. They may have a young family. You know, it's terrifying to have a new dog in the home that is showing aggression. And that's unfortunately one of the things that we're seeing with a lot of the um, a lot of the people that are calling themselves rescues at this point, but they're not actually registered as rescues. They've just sort of become they've just sort of come as fly by night organizations that have seen how much money there is to be made by pulling at people's heartstrings and saying this rescue dog needs a home. So we don't want you to be in that situation. We want, um, when you're looking for a rescue, ask about bite history, ask what the dog was like in the foster home. You know, there should be information that the foster family, typically when rescues come in, they end up in foster families for a little while while they're assessed. And then when the right home comes along, they're moved along from the foster family. So you want information from the foster family. What was the dog like? Does the dog get along with the other dogs in their home? Did the dog show any aggression over food? Um, you know, what, is that dog going to be a good fit for your lifestyle? Make sure that there's something legitimate there that you can say, okay, I believe this person, I believe this situation, whether it's a reference, whether it's, you know, a website and you see the, the registration number and you see that everything seems very legit and they've been around for a long enough time and, 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 you know, still do your homework with the rescues because that can go wrong very quickly as well. So we want you to have a great experience with getting your dog. For sure. And, and I think whether you are researching or contacting a breeder or researching and contacting a rescue, these uh, people will be quite proud of the work they've put in and uh, are more than willing to give you things like references, give you things uh, like medical history or, uh, you know, what they have access to. You know, they uh, a reputable breeder or rescue is quite proud of what they've accomplished. Um, so I think don't be afraid to ask these questions now. When our podcast listeners bring their new puppy home or they bring that rescue dog home, it's going to need some training and, and talk, talk to us a little bit about the my dog can program from McCann professional dog trainers and, and what our podcast listeners can get from that yeah absolutely my dog can is our grade one program built for an online environment so it is the entire program for teaching your dog to come when they're called regardless of what distractions they're out there first time you call every single time we want those dogs to turn on a dime we want to save their life as many times as we can throughout their lifetime. Um, we are going to work on walking on lead nicely so that you can enjoy your walks. Your dog's not pulling you down the street. And we're also going to teach sit and down stays. So we spend eight weeks of lessons teaching those skills, but you actually have access to the program for four months. You have access to the professional dog trainers at McCann's for those four months for support, whether it's, it's by phone, whether it's by email, or whether it's through our great little Facebook group that we have together. Um, and we can watch videos of your training and critique based on those. We can give you support, you know, just with ideas and troubleshooting. It's a really, really fantastic program. And there's a whole bunch of us that are involved in helping to support people in there. So, yeah, uh, I think yeah. one thing people um, wonder is that if they get access to an online dog training program, what if they encounter a problem or what if they're struggling understanding a skill? And uh, there is no better place than the My Dog Can program for you because you literally have access to professional dog trainers when you need it. You also have access to this amazing community of people who are training, do, you, doing the same skills you are. Uh, you know, we have professional dog trainers in the office answering the phones, answering your questions uh, six days a week. So, you know, they can, they're there to provide you su the support. If you are, you know, you live in a remote location or you have a super busy life that doesn't allow you to attend our classes, uh, you know, this is the perfect alternative. This allows you to have access to uh, the McCann method, uh, to our training style, but it also gives you access to the professional dog trainers that can help you to be successful. So, uh, you know, Shannon and I spent two years putting this program together so that it uh, was uh, the same kind of program, had the same efficiency and success as the grade one program that's helped over 80,000 dogs to, you know, come when called to walk on a loose leash. So uh, I, I am, uh, I'm excited when I, when we talk about the My Dog Camp program, I can't help but get excited because, because of the successes we've seen in our Facebook group. You know, um, we uh, had a, a student recently that was talking about taking her uh, young dog into uh, her, her first dog show. And, you know, she joined us when the dog was really little and, and uh, you know, she had 
had some questions along the way and we were able to help help her out and then she uh, was able to share with us you know the dog getting a ribbon at a show i mean it was it was so exciting to see that progression but I will link the My Dog Can program in the show notes below. And if you're watching this on our uh, YouTube podcast, then I'll link it in the description below. So I hope you guys found this uh, episode helpful, uh, episode of the podcast. I I, uh, I I learned some things as Shannon was, uh, you know, talking uh, us through some of the red flags that you might, uh, that you need to be aware of when you're purchasing a, a puppy um, or again, getting a, a, a rescue dog. I think there's some really great insight in there. And I want to thank you, Shannon for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was fun. And I'm glad to talk about this because that, that story that just broke my heart and it happens a lot. So yeah, yeah, it's, help it's, somebody. absolutely. And if this is your first time on the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We publish new videos every single week to help you understand the why behind how dogs think and learn. On that note, I'm Ken. Happy training. Bye everybody.